Good morning. Well done. You have had the mic for like the last 45 minutes, but it's... Awesome. Hey, uh, big thanks. Uh, lots of uh, Renault work happening this last week. Uh, it's just been fantastic. So, um, yeah, we've, we've done the, the big part of grinding the floor in the new hall down there. Um, so, uh, Kev, Kev came to my rescue and, uh, and helped me out on, on Friday. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very time-consuming, labor-intensive job. And so uh, if you're thinking of uh, grinding your concrete floor at your house, uh, my recommendation is don't. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good. And, uh, and thanks to, uh, to James and Joe Murphy. I don't know if they're here or out with their kids still. Ah, there they are. Uh, came and helped with some of the stuff in the kids' room and cleaning up uh, around the place and gardening and all sorts, so uh, very cool. Uh, Gordon, as always, Gordon just, just faithfully comes in. I just rock up some morning. There's Gordon doing gardening. And uh, so you might see, you might notice that, oh, it looks like that garden's been done. That's, it's not, uh, uh, we're not yet at that place of just miraculous garden transformation um, <laughs> by the Lord, but, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, thank you, Gordon. And, uh, and had some people, who was in yesterday helping out on the road day? Which, yeah, Brian and guys were. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and I uh, got some uh, stuff done on the ablution block and lots of other things, so it's just, uh, there's a lot of work, and uh, so if you are thinking to yourself, hey, maybe I could give a hand, like just any help will do, um, you can come and pull out some weeds or um, paint something, there's just always something to do, so please come and help and pour in to that so we can, like we are temporarily in this space, in this zone, so um, we want to get onto that. Awesome. It's cool. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, the title of my message is City Transformation. So uh, just, a, just a little one. Uh, again, probably some stuff that, I, that you may have heard me share before. Uh, I do find, though, that uh, sometimes I'll share on things several times, and then it's the last time that people go, oh, well, I've never heard that before. I'm like, really? Um, but that's okay, because I'm happy to talk about it again, and uh, hopefully you're happy to hear it again if you, if you have. Uh, and again, this, is, this sort of stuff for me, I feel like is, it's like my heart message, you know, this, the, the really the stuff that I uh, ponder on and think about, and so hopefully it, uh, it blesses you this morning. I want to read from Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 8. It's from the Passion Translation, and it says, God's plan all along was to bring this message of salvation to the nations through the revelation of faith. Long ago, God prophesied over Abraham, as the Holy Scriptures say, through your example of faith, all the nations will be blessed. And so the blessing of Abraham's faith is now our blessing too. Uh, and again, if you read in, uh, in the book of Ephesians, around chapter 3 there, where Paul talks about uh, in that section of the, you know, all of the promises that were given to, uh, to the Israelites were actually God's promises for all nations and, uh, and for all peoples, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles, which is all the rest of us, that's you and I unless you happen to be Jewish here this morning. Um, so that's the, the God's blessing, God's desire for the nations to be blessed, and now that becomes our mandate to carry into the nations of the earth. God's desire is for the nations to be blessed and to be blessed through His people. So not just God doing it on His own, but saying, I'm going to form a company of blessers that, would, that I'll send out into the nations to be a blessing, to bring the blessing of God to the nations. So we are called to disciple nations and to release God's kingdom and His purposes. That's what it says in Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. All ethnos is the word in the Greek. 
baptizing them into Trinitarian community, which we like to say. So it's not dunking them three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but baptism being immersion. It's immersing the people into the reality of the Godhead. So it's very much a supernatural thing. So as you disciple an individual or you disciple a region or a nation, essentially you are immersing them into the reality of Father God and you're immersing them into the reality of Jesus and you're immersing them, being, you know, inviting them into consuming and being consumed by the reality of Holy Spirit. It's a slightly bigger deal than just dunking people in water. And then teaching them to obey all of the commands of Jesus, which again isn't teaching them all the commands of Jesus, teaching them to obey. If we hear what Jesus has for us and we don't do it, we are, according to Jesus, foolish people that are building their house on the sand. So in that scripture where he's talking about, you know, if you build your, if you Hear my voice and you do what I tell you to do. You're a wise builder who builds their house on the rock. If you hear me and you don't do what I'm saying, then you're building your house on the sand. So this is not people who have never heard of Jesus. This is presumably people who might even be followers of Jesus who would say, who hear everything that Jesus says and then don't build their life on it. It's actually, you're actually worse off because now you know the truth and you don't walk in the truth. So that's why the community of God, our job working with one another in community is to help, let me help you to obey what Jesus said. I just want to tell you it, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, but to say, let me show you how we can walk that out. Amen? All right, that's first three lines done. Um, So we are called to disciple nations, release God's kingdom and his purposes on earth as it is in heaven. So God has a plan and he has a way that he's going to fulfill that plan. And that is through us, the church. Amen? All right. So God's original design, we have God creates the earth and he has this place called Eden. And then he places Adam and Eve in the garden and they're... um, call is their mandate is to see the reality of the Garden of Eden expand over the earth. So to bring order where there is chaos, to bring the blessing of God to every area of creation. So the the reality, the kingdom of God expanding over all creation. Now then we have the fall where they choose to turn away from God and, uh, and, you know, do the wrong thing. and, uh, And then the mandate essentially is lost. Okay, so we, they, they lose the mandate. Jesus comes and he restores the mandate to the people of God. So that point where he says, all authority has been given to me, go and essentially go and rule the nations. Go and disciple, go and lead the nations in my way. That's the mandate being restored to the people of God. And then the church becomes the vehicle to fulfill that mandate. That's the calling on your life is to bless the nations. The calling on your life is to disciple nations, to bring all nations under God, that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. That's on you. Put your hand up if that's the calling on your life. Yeah, I don't don't know what plan God has for me, and I just don't know. It's, It's that. If you're a disciple of Jesus, that's the call on your life, and it's a big one. Now, the part that you play might be small, the part that you play might be massive, and again, that's up to God and the grace that He releases to your life, but ultimately, that's the the calling upon His church is to be a blessing to the nations. God has a redemptive plan for all of creation, and it's not just about, you know, growing healthy churches, doing, you know, church well and hanging out together and, you know, being a nice little kind of Christian enclave in the world. The goal is a return of God's original purposes for creation, for humanity, humanity to be fruitful, multiply and subdue the earth, to see the earth become like heaven. That was God's original plan and that plan was never, he didn't give up on that plan, but he said, well, that was my plan. You messed it up, so I sent my son, and now we're going to fulfill that plan. And that is really important that we understand, and as I've shared many times before, when we talk about the gospel message, the modern version of the gospel message is a gospel of salvation. 
where it's very individualistic. And this gospel message has only been around for the last couple of hundred years, this version of it, okay? Now, I'm not saying God doesn't want to save people and have them born again, all of that sort of stuff, but that is part of a much bigger mandate that God's about. So the gospel message we have is, as an individual, hey, you're a sinner, you're going to go to hell, pray this prayer, and then you'll go to heaven. Done. Awesome. Great. I know there's a bit more to it, but that's oftentimes what's presented to people as the gospel. Oh, man, you've got to preach the gospel, which is go out, convict people of their sin, let them know how bad they are, let them know how good God is, let them know how how good heaven's going to be, pray this prayer, get salvation, you'll go to heaven one day, join a church, do some stuff, all good. But again, very narrow, individualistic aspect. But see, the gospel is from the beginning until the end, which is creation, ultimately to the glorification of God's people. And this is where we see the the four kind of major points, creation, fall, redemption, and then ultimate restoration. That's the fullness of the gospel message. That's why Jesus, when he, he didn't say, I've come to save people, I've come to to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the reality of my kingdom to this earth. So when we talk about uh, ministering, being a minister of God, um, ministry is not what's done in the church and mission outside of the church. That's kind of been a common language. It's like, oh, so you you do ministry in the church and you do mission outside of the church. And often mission, so a mission's organization or what we call the missions department of the church is often then cross-cultural like other nations. But all of what we do for God is ministry. So in our language, we have boxed in ministry to mean the programs of the church. But the reality is there, there were no programs in the church that Jesus started. There were people and there were needs. That's the two things that you get in a church. (laughs) People and needs. Who's ever experienced that, yeah? So the church operated like a family. So in the same way, like in a family, if your children are hungry, you don't have a board meeting to decide how we're going to start up a food distribution ministry. No, you, 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 you make them some food. <clears throat> now, again, I understand that as, as, as communities grow and there's more of a, of a need for infrastructure and ways to facilitate healthy family, but at the end of the day, it's all about providing for a healthy family. In the same way that is, you know, if, if, uh, if two single people get married, now all of a sudden there's different provision needs. Maybe they move out of their parents' home to get married and they've got to now provide their own home. They've got to pay rent. They've got to do those sorts of things. You have one child. Different sort of infrastructure needs to happen. You need to plan your days differently. You have two children, you have three children. As it goes on, things change. But now, ultimately, it's all about meeting the needs of the children and, you know, and, and raising them well. And so, in the church, there are, you know, it's important that we have infrastructure so that things happen well and people are loved well. Not so that we put on nice events and have everything look nice, but it's that people are cared for and loved and brought into a, a greater measure of wholeness. So ministry in the early church was just simply people loving other people. Wherever needs existed, people met them. They opened their homes and their hearts to serve and love others, and in so doing, they fulfilled the call of God on their life to love their neighbor. And we talk a lot about the fivefold ministry. The role of the fivefold ministry was to equip people to love God and love their neighbor, to make disciples and to bring God's kingdom to earth. So our communities out there and in here are filled with leaders. And again, leadership in the church is often defined by those who lead what happens on a Sunday. But everyone is a leader in some capacity. If you want to know if you're a leader, turn around and look. If anyone's following you, you're a leader. If you're influencing people in any way, you're a leader, and you are called to make disciples, so naturally their calling on your life is to be a leader. It might look differently, and it's important that we don't just put this box around what it looks like, but you are leading. You might be leading your children, you might be leading in a workplace, you might be leading in a school, whatever environment you're in, in a friendship group, you have leadership gifting and leadership opportunity. 
But we often miss, in the church, we often miss training leaders for kingdom ministry and only train ministers for people for pastoral ministry. Leaders then look elsewhere for the leadership training and therefore get trained by worldly leaders with worldly principles. And we've seen this in both ways, that the church has been influenced heavily by kind of worldly principles of what leadership looks like. And it's, and it's influenced the church greatly where we, I think we've lost some of that kingdom understanding of what leadership is. And leadership can be all about finding the people that are going to get stuff done. Rather than seeking out how can we love people and then bring them into wholeness. Because the problem is if you're a leader and you build something, it's a bit of a waste if at the end you blow it up. Which is what happens when we don't focus on the heart and we only focus on the charisma or the capability of a person. So I believe we need to restore a right authority order between the leadership of the church and those who are leaders in the community. The leadership of the church is the leadership of people, not church activities. When we enter into the family of God, we come into a spiritual family that has mothers and fathers. There is spiritual order in the church, and God appoints certain people to be in authority. Now, before your alarm bells start going off, and Brad, this is a sermon where you're trying to get us to do everything you say, it's not going there. Don't worry. (laughs) Okay. But what I'm I'm trying to get to, and hopefully will come out in the message, that we've we can have this idea that it's like, oh, there's there's the church kind of realm and what we do here, and then there's you know the real world out there, and and we kind of see this as two different things. We're very good at kind of compartmentalizing our lives and, and boxing it in in this kind of way. But to understand that I believe the church hasn't done a good job at raising people to be kingdom-minded and to be living in the world as kingdom ambassadors. But the church has been very good at knowing how to run, do its stuff inside the church and trying to train people to do that. So we train small group leaders or we train Bible study leaders or we we, we train children's or youth pastors. You know, we, we train all of these people and do a lot of training, but it's all ultimately for the internal work of what happens in the church. But the role of the church is to impact the nations. And so if we're not training and influencing and equipping people to be a blessing out there, then really we're not fulfilling the role of, of what we're here for. So, uh, you know, there's, there's the natural order of just caring for a community of people. Um, I don't want to tell you, we, do a, we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy loving people into wholeness. Like a lot of time and a lot of energy, there's a lot of focus um, and, and intentionality about not letting anyone fall through the gaps. And like it's, it's, it's incredibly costly and it's an incredibly high value for us. But again, we don't just want to be a people then, oh, we've just got this whole community of just whole people. And we're all, oh, we're all good now. It's like, but it, it's, it's unto something as well to take that then into homes and families and neighborhoods and ultimately nations as well. So God's authority extends into every area of people's lives because God's intentions and authority extends into every area of people's lives. So it becomes normal for people to separate their lives into sacred and secular activities. So it's like prayer is sacred and work is secular. Worship is sacred, but my leisure time is secular. Tithing is sacred. What I do with the other 90%, that's secular. There are certain areas of our lives that we allow people to speak into, and the rest is up to us. So it's like, well, the church's role, they can inform me on spiritual things, but I'll make decisions on every other area of my life. But I don't see the divide in Scripture. See, everything is spiritual. Everything is from God and for God. God has something to say about everything you do, and the kingdom of God should be influencing and impacting every area of your life. So your work, your marriage, your children, your home, your finances, it's important that we grasp the pervasiveness of the Lordship of Jesus. It's important that we grasp the pervasiveness of Jesus. So what I mean is the way that Jesus pervades and invades every area of your life. There is no part of your life that Jesus doesn't have a thought on, an opinion on, a desire for. Every area. 
Now, I'm not saying that we get to that point, it's like, oh, Jesus, what sort of cars should I drive in? Should I get a red one or a blue one? And manual or automatic? Like, oh, my Lord, I need to hear from you. And so you go into a week of prayer and fasting. I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about those sorts of things, but He cares about every area of your life because the decisions that you make ultimately impact you, they impact the people around you, and they impact the ones that God wants to bless through you. He is Lord of all, and He must be Lord of your all. He is Lord of all, and He wants to be Lord of your all, or your all. Yeah. So again, this is not about you coming under the control of of some religious order or leader or group or something like that. It's not about, okay, well, I'll just do whatever the pastor says, or I'll just do whatever this person says. It's, It's not about that at all. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I'm not your Lord. Amy's not your Lord, Rachel, you laugh up leader, like they're not your Lord, Jesus is Lord. But leaders in the church are stewards of God's family. So it's about opening up all of our life to the influence of God and the leadership that God provides through His people. So we can say, oh, well, you know, the ground around the cross is flat and, you know, Jesus is my Lord and no one else is my Lord, but God still appoints authority figures in your life. You can't say, well, you know, well, you know, Jesus Lord, and I'm not going to listen to what that leader says, but are you going to do the same when it comes to the police? You get pulled over, oh no, it's all right, I don't, I don't respect your authority, Jesus is my Lord, I'm just going to keep speeding. And you'll get pulled over and arrested and fined or put in jail and those sorts of things, you know. So we understand that authority, there's authority orders in place, and Romans says that God appoints those authority figures. Sometimes righteous, sometimes unrighteous but he is the one who appoints authority. And so then we say, well, in, in, a, in a family, in the same way that like a mother and a father have a, an authority over a natural family, and we say, okay, so there's still an authority, a responsibility to serve. That God says, I want you to take on the responsibility of loving and serving and equipping and blessing and releasing. Okay? And it's a big responsibility to take on. I think when you become even a parent in the natural, you're just like, holy moly, people's lives literally depend upon me. Like, that's, that's a big responsibility to carry, and, and praise the Lord for prayer ministry. <laughs> Not just for the parents, but you know, it's like, okay, well, one day, my kids, they'll just have some prayer ministry for me. It'll be okay. I'll be good. <laughs> so, it's important then that leaders as spiritual kind of family, um, as spiritual parents, that they lead with kingdom values. It gets very dangerous when leaders don't lead like Jesus. And sometimes that can be the case because we, we live very pragmatically. So we think about the practical things. We say, well, we've got to get it done because God's got this calling and this mandate to, to save the lost and to bless the nation. So we just got to get it done almost at any cost. But the problem is that we cost people. And so it's like we, we, we're burning out people for the sake of reaching other people. And that, but that's not how you love a family well. You say, uh, you know what, sorry kids, we don't have any food uh, for us to eat this week because I gave all of our money to buy food for the family down the street. Sorry kids, it's like, no, no, uh, my responsibility is here because that's my first error and then if I have more, then we'll do that as well or I'll I'll help those parents to be responsible enough to care for their own children. But but you know, I mean, there's a a right order. We have to live like Jesus and lead like Jesus. In the kingdom, leaders are servants. You know, my role is to lead you by serving you, and your role is to serve well by then leading other people. There's a well-known leadership axiom that says that leaders are learners, and this is true, but in the kingdom, leaders are lovers. Leaders are servants of the people. But see, then that's the culture that's set. You know, I, I like the kind of the, the thought that if someone, so for me as, as the senior leader over this community, that if I set, um, if I set the example of, of lowliness and humility to that point, it also strips away the thing to say, I want to be at the top. Okay, well, that's down there. Because that's what Jesus did. Philippians 2, Jesus did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, coming in the form of a servant, being obedient to death, even death on a cross. So at the right time that God would exalt him. So humiliation comes before exaltation. That's the way of the kingdom. You want to be first, you've got to be last. You want to be the greatest, then be the least. 
This is this upside down, back to front, inside out, paradoxical kingdom that Jesus established. It's a good name. So that's my goal is to, is to love well and then to be responsible. And sometimes to love well is to make hard calls that people don't like. And that's okay as well. You don't have to like the decisions that I make because I'm accountable for my decisions. All right. Mark chapter 8, verse 14. And it's speaking of the leaven of Pharisees and Herod. So now they had forgotten to bring bread and then only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves... For the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? So he speaks at the beginning here of the leaven of the Pharisees and, and Herod. So the church has historically been influenced and is always in danger of being influenced by either the leaven of the Pharisees or the leaven of Herod. So leaven is what is kneaded into dough that makes the dough rise. So it's, it's like yeast. It's used in cooking to make dough rise. So when leaven is added to the dough, it becomes part of the dough. Once you knead that leaven into it and it starts to activate, you can't then remove the leaven out of the dough. It has become part of the dough. So the leaven is a metaphor used throughout Scripture, and it means different things, but in this verse it would seem to be speaking of two different influential worldviews and spiritual realities that can and do influence followers of Jesus and therefore the church. So the leaven of the Pharisees represents the religious worldview or that religious spirit. The religious spirit seeks to control and maintain the power position through rules and regulations and false spiritual authority. And the leaven of Herod represents a political worldview or a political spirit. The political spirit seeks to control and maintain the power position through conquest and oppression and corrupt civil authority. So these two kind of worldviews, these two kind of power mechanisms that can exist in the world is the religious one. That's where in the bad form of religion where it seeks to control and to, be, um, to lord power over people. And again, this is often, unfortunately, the example that is set to the world that turns the world away from Jesus because they see these corrupt religious organizations and institutions that just want to lord it over. They want to be in the power position. They want to be in that place that says, well, everyone just listen to us because we are the moral authority on all things. Or that political spirit, which can influence the church as well. Well, now we want to seek through even political means to, to be in this power position. And, and lord that position over people. I, it's, still, it's still there in us, and I see it sometimes in leaders or in churches, where it's like, it's almost like the expectation is that the world should consult us on all things that pertain to morality. And yet they don't. And yet we keep trying to jostle for position to be the ones that everyone, why don't you come and ask the church and we'll tell you what you need to do. But the world doesn't because we've actually lost that power position because we gained it in the wrong way. So the other type of leaven that Jesus speaks about is the leaven of the kingdom. And we read about this in Matthew 13, 33. It says, he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. So the leaven of the kingdom comes in secret and it comes in service. It doesn't seek dominion through control or oppressive force, but through meekness, humility, service, and love in the natural, and warfare, intercession, and transformation in the spiritual. 
It's not weak, although it may sometimes seem that way. It is powerful because it is the very presence of God, backed by the heart of God, and brought about by the armies of God. That's us. The religious spirit and political spirit have influenced the church for millennia. I believe, Brad Joss's opinion, is that it started with Constantine and has continued since then. The early church was a powerful, expansive, and transformational force that made a radical impact, and yet it was oppressed by the nations that it existed in. But it was transforming society to the point where, you know, we can assume that even this Roman emperor, Constantine, he said, these guys are moving up. I want to be on, on their team. And so he, he converted and he made all of Rome to be Christian. But the kingdom of God was expanding without any help from any civil authorities. And, and one of the reasons why it expanded so quickly is because the way that they served. So when people would, you know, would give birth to a, a baby girl, and it's like, well, that's no good for our family, so they would throw their babies onto the garbage heap to die. And the Christian women would go out onto the garbage heaps and rescue these babies and bring them back and, and raise them up and nurture them. It was, it was this way of service and serving, and, it just, and they had these, you know, secret love fests, like the early church was not seeker sensitive in any way. Like you couldn't get into the church, like that would stop you at the door. If you tried to come to a, this underground meeting of the church, you'd be stopped and you'd be quizzed to make sure that you're actually a follower of Jesus and not a spy sent in to infiltrate. So uh, there's, you can read about Constantine, and, and, but essentially this, this apostolic movement of the church, it, there was no kind of centralized leadership. It was all this kind of apostolic mothers and fathers, this overseeing community and traveling around and expanding radically like this. And then all of a sudden it gets thrust into the power position. And so then a lot of what we see, um, even, uh, so anyone been to like, St. is it St. Peter's Basilica? There's all these famous churches around Europe. And so the word basilica was a Roman meeting house. So even the format that church buildings took on, all of a sudden when now, now we have freedom to, to be public, they took on even the form of, of Roman buildings. And, uh, and then, you know, the introduction of the Pope and all this kind of stuff that went on from there, that was all influenced by the culture around them. But as soon as they were given that place of civil authority, they lost their apostolic authority. And the expansive movement, now I'm saying Christianity, you know, spread around, but it was because you were now, oh, you're, you're, you're in Rome, you're a Christian now. Really? Don't know anything about Jesus, don't love him, don't want to follow him, but I guess I'm a Christian now because I live in this city or this town. And we see that that's what formed into what we call Christendom, where it's just like everyone was a Christian, you know, or a Catholic or whatever you wanted to, you know, to call them. It's like, well, this everyone was because you were just born into the family, but it lost that, it lost the intimacy. Uh, the prophetic voice was shut down. Evangelism was shut down. There's no point evangelizing to people because you're just born into Christianity. So it would seem natural, sorry, it would seem natural to see this as a triumph for Jesus and the church, but I would disagree. Constantine brought the religious and political spirit together and called it Christianity. The problem is the kingdom culture and dynamic was lost. Christianity was thrust into a power position, not by love and service, but by conquest and decree. It was given influence in society because of its political and religious position, and not because of the power of the Holy Spirit or the example of Christ or the apostolic movement of His church through the nations. And this has continued for generations to the point that we have lost the true meaning of what it is to live as kingdom people. The dominant paradigm in the church's thinking is that we should be in the power position in society. Like it's eroded away and no one listens to the church and no one does what the church says and they're all a bunch of heathens doing all their own thing and making all of these bad decisions. But that's because the church has failed in its role to be an expansive kingdom movement on the earth influencing every era of society with the leaven of the kingdom of God. Jesus was very clear that the conquest of the kingdom would not come how people expected. 
Even his own disciples expected a militant overthrow of earthly governmental structures to usher in the kingdom, but that's not how God planned it. So Luke 17, verse 20. It says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, behold, for the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Which is Jesus himself, that's why he's the word of God, the fullness of the message of God. He is the logos of God, the message of God's redemptive plan and the fullness of God coming to the earth. So Jesus represented the kingdom. That's why every time I said the kingdom of God is at at hand, because he's the king. So wherever the king is, the kingdom is. And that's why when we come under the lordship of Jesus and he is our king, then we become part of that kingly order. Priests and kings ministering to the nations. The kingdom is Jesus. So how does the kingdom of God come in a city? Well, it starts with us, ordinary people. When we get captivated by Jesus and filled with His Spirit, we become a transformational force of good. But it's not then about forming armies and military conquests. God takes us as ordinary people, fills us with His extraordinary nature and power, and sends us out into the world. Again, the example of Jesus, he showed what a normal life was empowered by the presence of God. That's why he did not uh, walk in his divinity, he walked in humanity under the power of the divine when the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, he is fully God and fully man, but he did not live under his divine nature, he lived under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he didn't do anything until his baptism at 30. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, immediately he then goes out and starts ministering for three years. He set the example for you to follow and for me to follow. It's like, well, if Jesus did that under the power of the Holy Spirit, that means I can do that under the power of the Holy Spirit, which is why Jesus said to his disciples, he'd breathed on them, he'd filled them with the Spirit that spent three years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week with Jesus. And he said to them, after I go, don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come upon you in power. So it's like, I know you've spent three years with the incarnate Christ, God in the flesh. That wasn't enough because you will not do anything of significance until the Holy Spirit has come upon you in power. And that's what happens at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then they became witnesses of God throughout all the regions. So as we live as ordinary citizens, operating under the lordship of Jesus, being changed every day into his likeness, and walking in the power of the Spirit, his kingdom is released into society. Jesus took off his godliness and put on humanity. Jesus showed us how to live as ordinary people immersed in the presence of God. And you are God's agent of kingdom transformation. God wants to use you in ordinary ways to make an extraordinary impact on the world around you. It's not the church as a gathered people, but also the church as a scattered people that is to impact a city. If this is all that we do, and that's why, again, when people, I don't call this church, this is a gathering of the church. We are the ecclesia of God, the church of God. We are the people of God. And we spend a small amount of time gathered, but it's when we're scattered, it's when we're out there, that's when God wants to see His kingdom come. That's when the real work begins. This is connection time, family time, equipping time, empowering time, learning time, all of that good stuff, ministering to God, which He loves and He deserves us to do that. Again, what we're establishing with this in and out culture of the daily kind of prayer room opportunity for engagement, it's coming in and encountering the Father in order to go out and impact the world. So I believe that we're yet to fully grasp and live out what it means to be a missional people. To know who we are, what we carry, and what we're called to accomplish for God. 
And when the church has tried to impact the city, it's often seen the people as a resource for the church to serve the purposes of the organization. You are not a resource to serve my purposes. You are not a resource to serve the purposes of the leadership of this church. The leadership of this church is a resource to equip and empower you to meet and impact the society. So we don't want anything from you. Like we're here to serve you. And if you're in a leadership role in this community, it's like, well, I'm, I'm just here to, to give. But again, it doesn't stop. If it just then stops at you, oh, I'm just receiving all this blessing. I'm receiving all this love. I'm receiving all this healing, all this pastoral care, all this accountability, all this friendship, all this community. Oh, I'm just loving this. But you've got to give it away. <laughs> Like, it doesn't stop at you. So historically, there has been a distrust between, you know, church leaders and business or community leaders. And this is because it has gone wrong in the past. So where we've seen the, the secularization of church structures and oversight, so where the church starts to become more like a business and act like a business, it's like CEOs, it's all about numbers and finances and activities and programs and all of these sorts of things. So it's been influenced by the leadership culture of the world, which is fine in business, but it doesn't work in the kingdom. Or on the flip side, we've seen this kind of, you know, lame Christian representation in business, where it's like, I'm going to impact the nations by putting a fish logo on my business name. That'll do it. Everyone's going to ask, oh, what's that fish symbol mean? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. And they'll get saved. It'll be awesome. And it's like, and hey, listen, if you got a fish symbol on your, on your logo, bless you. I'm not, it's not a criticism, okay? Because I'm sure you are, I know people's heart is for the right thing. But it's like, but we, there's, there's more to it than that. There's a little bit more to it than just, you know, well, I'll wear a cross around my neck. Yeah. Hardcore evangelist right there. Do it, but there's, more, there's a lot more to it than that, yeah? Cool. Everyone's... <sighs> yeah, that's it. But the church has failed to equip people to live as missionaries and society transformers. People have been trained to lead Bible studies or prayer me- meetings, which might work in the life of the church or in this kind of Christian... Christendom mentality, but they don't work in the world. And they also don't r- release the right grace upon people to make disciples and release kingdom, in, kingdom order into society. We have tried in the past to spiritualize the secular, and unfortunately, it has backfired us on so, in so many ways. So again, sometimes we just try and, well, we'll just make this secular activity spiritual. Well, I like to play basketball. Awesome. You should go start a Christian basketball league. Yeah, that's the way. Um, you know, or it's like Christian sport or Christian this or Christian that. And it's like, like, you know, we just try and call something Christian and then we'll, we'll somehow impact society with Christian values, which I don't know if you've ever played Christian basketball or sports, but it's, it's often the worst. Yeah. It's coming on a Monday night. <laughs> Our indoor soccer team. No, no. We're standing up for righteousness. We're fighting for righteousness is what we're doing. So. <laughs> but it's important to understand that particularly, um, you know, business leaders, community leaders, people of influence, you know, teachers and uh, people working in business, they have more scope and sway in society than the church does. Far more than the co- corporate church does. So the role of the church is to equip, empower, and release people into the world to make disciples and bring the kingdom in a way that we call incarnational. So incarnate means in flesh. You know, like carnal, yeah, carnivore, that's the Latin for flesh. So incarnation means you come in the flesh in the same way that Jesus did, that a lot of people didn't recognize that he was God because he looked like us. So in the same way, to bring the leaven of the kingdom, it's not this announcement and pronouncement, well, I'm the boss of this company and I'm a Christian, so you're all going to be Christians and you're all going to do Christian things and you're going to stop doing this and do more of this. We're going to have a Bible study on Tuesdays and a prayer meeting on Wednesdays. If you don't come, I'm going to dock your pay and, you know, like, that's one way to do it. 
But it's not. It just looks normal. It looks natural. It's just influenced by the culture that you represent and the values that you give. And the air is that you have favor in a place. So, again, I'm, I'm bagging on church leadership, but I've, I've been in it for, I've been a pastor for six, 15 years now, since I was 21. And you go, that's 36, surely you're older than 36. No, I'm not. I, 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 I do it to myself, so by growing facial hair. So church leadership can see that they alone have a mission that others are called to help fulfill. So that's, again, we can look at, what the, what's the kingdom? Well, it's the church, you know, expanding. No, 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 the kingdom of God is the lordship of Jesus. The church is a vehicle for bringing about kingdom expansion. Okay, very different. But it's the call of all believers to bring the kingdom. And business or community leaders are primarily, so sometimes it can be seen like, oh, you, you run a business, awesome, come along so you can help fund the church. We're going to have a special business leaders breakfast where, you know, we're going to put on a nice spread so you can sign a nice fat check. Shouldn't have said that out loud. But it can become this thing where it's like, no, the church is doing this thing. And, oh, yeah, you do your business. That's, oh, that's so good. But can you, you know, I want your business to prosper so then the church can prosper. No, your business will prosper when the kingdom of God comes to your business and you start impacting and influencing the nations through your business, start leading that culture of your business to look like the kingdom of God. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to see. Now, God will bless you and give you financial provision, and it helps to support. You want to support your family as much as anyone, so you'll tithe and you'll give and you'll pour in, and you'll support the, you know, the, the, the care of the community through your giving. Amen. Bless you. But if that's not, if you're looking to say, oh, my role as a kingdom, you know, someone who has finances and is in the kingdom is just to give more to the church, that's a very, very small part of the calling on your life. If you are in business and you, like, if you're a boss of a company or you're in a, a leadership role in some sense, and I'm talking specifically about business here, but if you're in that place, it's like, I get to set the culture over a whole stack of people. I get to set the culture in this environment. So, wow, I've just learned about by getting healed from and doing a large house of performance orientation. How do I set a culture that looks like the kingdom that is not ruled by performance orientation? That's the kingdom of God coming. That's the values of the kingdom of freedom and responsibility and all of these things that we're learning. How does that infiltrate into this culture? How can I spread the leaven of the kingdom into this place? Rather than how do I, you know, raise up, you know, strong, hard line, you know, hardcore leaders that are just going to keep everyone in line and, you know, threaten them with getting the sack if they don't do, do better. And Tim's chuckling along. You know, like, how, can I do that? Or how do I, how do I, develop and raise up leaders that are that are just servants and more like kind of parents in this place and they're they're seeking the good and the welfare of their workers not just you know kind of ticking boxes and you know kpis and all of those sorts of things but that's when we start to see the kingdom of god come into every realm of society So again, the fivefold ministry exists to equip, empower, and release world changers. So whether that be stay-at-home mums, business leaders, community leaders, high school students, wherever you are, you have a, a metron, you have a sphere of influence that you can impact with the values of God's kingdom. But we need a radical paradigm shift to break free from the stranglehold of past religious institutional structures and leadership frameworks in order to see the effectiveness of the church realized. Again, when it comes to authority in the church, it's like, well, you've got to listen to me because I'm the pastor. No, don't listen to me because of a role that I've been given. Listen to me because you actually value what I'm saying and you believe it to be true, so then you own it. And if you disagree, then have a conversation. But it's like, we've got to even get away from that sort of stuff. I want people to follow me if I'm a leader because they want to follow me. Because they're like, you've got something that I want or you're going somewhere that I want to go. I'm, I'm with you in this. So you, you, you're probably not going to find a whole lot of control. Now, someone might say, no, you can't do that because that conflicts with the culture of this community. No, you, I'm sorry, you can't treat people like that in this community. 
Or, no, I'm sorry, it's, it's not okay for you to behave like that in this community. Like, there's, it's not like there's no restriction. Everyone's like, oh, you're just free. Everyone, just be free and think, because your freedom will impact other people, and then they won't be free. So that's why we teach freedom and responsibility always go hand in hand. Yeah? So you've got to be responsible with your freedom. But again, we want to see, and so you get to influence the people around you because they want to follow you. People followed Jesus because they wanted to follow Jesus. He didn't stand up and say, I just want to let you know, everyone, I'm the son of God. Come here to save the nations. If you don't follow me, you're going to go to hell. Your choice, you're completely free, eternal damnation or follow me. Which one do you choose? You know? he, he, he actually kept it secret. He kept telling people, don't tell people what happened just now. And they still would because they're, you know, naughty. But, but you know, he didn't, he didn't go around and now he, he said, hey, the kingdom of God's at hand because the king's at hand. The kingdom of God's at hand, because the king's here. You know, like he didn't, he didn't go around doing it in that way. But even his disciples are like, okay, Jesus, we're ready for you to whip out the big guns. Where's the weapons? Where's the swords? You know, how are we going to, even at the point where he is captured, the night before his crucifixion, and he's like, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He's like, no, put your sword away. God's doing this. God's in this. It's okay. So again, you may have heard about the, the seven mountains of society. So that's you know, business, government, media, arts and entertainment, education, the family and religion. And the idea is that whoever controls these mountains has control over society. So if we have, I know Tim uh, Ferriss, when he was here, spoke on some of these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I don't need to write it. You can look that up at another time. You all know how to Google stuff, so... Um, but essentially, you'd say, well, these are seven kind of areas of influence in our society. So the education sector is an area of influence that impacts and influences a whole lot of people, okay? Um, but our thought is, well, we need to get people ruling these areas. And I think ultimately that is what we want to see, is the culture of the kingdom influenced at the top of these areas of society, Yeah? But I don't believe that our attention should simply be about climbing and reaching the pinnacle of one of the seven mountains of societal influence. Our goal is to change the mountain. It's not about climbing the mountain, it's about changing the mountain. Because I want you to know, who determines the peak of the mountain? The mountain does. I was even looking up this morning how a mountain's formed. You know, when tectonic plates kind of crush together. But it's literally the mountain itself that forms the peak. Or when erosion, when, if you have a, to say the, the religious sector that's influenced most primarily by Christianity, and maybe that's formed because the mountain has risen up with the values of the kingdom, and they're like, we need someone that can lead this mountain, and we say, we choose Jesus. Or the educational sector, it's like it's been so influenced by the kingdom of God because 11 of the kingdom has so influenced that mountain that we say, we need someone to lead this mountain. It's got to be Jesus. Because the, the mountain has risen up. And because the mountain is so full of Jesus, then Jesus pops out the top. Or the mountain is already formed, but by through erosion. The other way that mountains are formed is through erosion. Through what's around it getting worn down. So as culture that doesn't reflect the kingdom of God, as that's eroded away, then what is left is the leaven of the kingdom influencing the mountain. You can reach the summit of a mountain through finding the right pathway up the mountain, but the mountain stays the same. But as the leaven of the kingdom, we can infiltrate every aspect of the mountain to bring about the transformation of that mountain and in turn the transformation of society. We need to move away from the political and earthly dominion focused approach to societal change and follow the example of Christ and serve the world. Through service, humility, and God's favor, he will raise up the right people to lead the mountain. But the mountain appoints the people that lead it. So when we have an area, you know, to say in, in morality, and again, I don't, I, don't, I don't call the church one of the mountains, I say religion and spirituality, because I believe the church, and I'm going to explain how I see the role of the church functioning here. And again, this is just like a... Uh, sociological kind of view of the world. 
Um, and these could be principalities and powers, who knows, but I'm just saying it's not like, you're not going to find the seven mountains in the Bible explained in this kind of way, but it's a way to view the world and the view of the kingdom and infiltrating it. Um, but I'll say, yes, so the, the role then of the church as to, is to release the leaven of the kingdom into these areas of influence. Okay? But I see the role of the church being this part here, and the church influences those who are impacting these areas. So the word ecclesia, which is the most common Greek word that's translated as church, um, in, it, was a, it was a pre-existing word. So Jesus didn't create the word ecclesia. He took it from culture in the same way that, that he took the word, you know, where we get the word evangelist from or we get the word, you know, um, apostle from, apostolos. They were pre-existent words and Jesus added a kingdom dimension to it and utilized it to explain the church or the role of, of the kingdom and how it works and all that sort of stuff. So the word ecclesia was a civil governing body in Roman culture, pre-existent. So this is where they would get people together and they would discuss things and then ultimately make decisions that would impact the civil life of a town or an area. Okay, a civil governing body. We think of the church as being, you know, the people of God collected together um, or a place that we meet, a building that we meet in or a time that we meet and all of that sort of stuff, which again is why we're probably like, oh, Brad, get over the whole church thing. It's like it has a big impact because <laughs> it literally shapes how you view your role in the world. This is not an enclave. This is, this is a civil governing body, a spiritual governing body for this area, for this region. Currently, for the region, we feel like God's given us a regional mandate, so we have authority, spiritual authority in this region to determine how things go, to determine what principalities and powers exist, to determine what territorial strongholds are allowed to have power here. This is where it gets big, when we're worshiping together on a Sunday or during the week and we're in intercession, like we're dealing with significant things, but that's what a, a spiritual governing body does. So it's actually, no, we're not going to stand for that. Or when God reveals, like we've had times where God has led us through seasons of intercession of where it might be you know, rebellion over an age range in the region. And so we stand in, in repentance and we come against, you know, those sorts of things where there's the, we had, you know, that season with the python spirit, which is all um, woven into um, the foundation, the spiritual foundation of these regions and God leads into it. So it's all crazy out there, weird spiritual things. Sorry if that upsets you. Sorry, not sorry. But you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I get it. Like, I, I didn't grow up in the church um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't then, I didn't, wasn't thrust into like charismatic church. I was, you know, I'm very kind of analytical process, linear in my thought and all that sort of stuff. And then, but thankfully the Holy Spirit awakened me to the kingdom realm. And so I see differently and I see the impact because it's played out and you track what God leads you through and you see the impact of things. But anyway, uh, Acts 17 verse 1. And it says, uh, oh, so this is, uh, oh, I've got to read it from my Bible. There you go. Acts 17. Don't all turn at once. So it says, uh, After passing through the cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia, Apollonia, Paul and Silas arrived at Thessalonica. As they customarily did, they went to the synagogue to speak to the Jews from the Torah scrolls. For three weeks, Paul challenged them by explaining the truth and proving to them the reality of the gospel, that the Messiah had to suffer and die, then rise again from among the dead. He made it clear to them, saying, I come to announce to you that Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah. Some of the Jews were convinced that their message was true, so they joined Paul and Silas, along with quite a few prominent women and a large number of Greeks who worshipped God. But many of the Jews were motivated by bitter jealousy and formed a large mob out of the troublemakers, unsavory characters and street gangs to incite a riot. They set out to attack Jason's house, for he had welcomed the apostles into his home. The mob was after Paul and Silas and sought to take them by force and bring them out to the people. When they couldn't find him, they took Jason instead, along with some of the brothers in his house church, and dragged them before the city council. 
Along the way, they screamed out, these troublemakers who have turned the world upside down have come here to our city. And now Jason and these men have welcomed them as guests, these traitors to Caesar, teaching them that there is another king named Jesus. The early church was a threat to the civil governing authorities because they were following a different king. They were following a different order. They were living in a different way. They weren't coming out in mobs trying to attack people, trying to dominate people. They were just loving and serving, meeting in secret. The church should be a threat to establish controlling governments. And it is in other places in the world. You think of a place like China, where communism reigns, which is you know, a dominant controlling force. They don't let the church meet together publicly unless they do it in exactly the way that communism would have, the government would tell them, you can do this, you can say this, and you can't say this, because it's a threat to them. The Christianity is a threat to communism. So that's why you've got then all of these underground churches who are like, no, no, we're, we're going to do it Jesus' way. But it's a threat. And, and so it's like we should be a threat. The early church was the same. One thing that, that I think we find in Western culture, Western culture doesn't confront values. It erodes them. So we live in a, in a cultural paradigm that doesn't confront values, it erodes them. It starts to see the world, secularism, whatever you want to call it, has eroded Christian values in each of the mountains. And the church has just said, let's just hold on to the position of power. Keep holding on, guys. Grip harder. Oh, it's crumbling away. It's okay. Grip harder. We've got to fight for this position of power. And we've lost the mountain. So then eventually... They start getting knocked off the top. Even the religious one, where it used to be that, you know, the Catholic Church was that dominant uh, religious force, no longer. We haven't fought for the mountain. We've fought for the power position because we've had the wrong mentality of what it looks like to live as kingdom people. The role of the church is to do battle in heaven and shape culture on earth. Heaven to earth requires translation. It's the spiritual to the natural, and both have to happen. So we're not supposed to then just be this kind of, um, you know, just like, oh, let's just go out and just love people, and we'll just feed the poor and do those sorts of things, and we should absolutely be doing that. Wherever we find us, we don't need a homeless ministry. If you're like, this church doesn't serve the homeless enough, just go do it. Like, no one's stopping you. No one's stopping you. If you want to invite a homeless person to come and live at your house, I've had homeless people living in our front yard. Like, you know, like we just do that because you see a need and you don't go, oh, how am I going to do this? Quick, quick, we're going to form a committee and decide what are we going to do with this problem? Buy some extra groceries, go and give them away. Like it's not that complicated. But again, we have this thing of like, I've got to go and figure it out and probably just, just do it, man. Just be like Jesus. Don't think, oh, I just saw someone at the shops. They're on crutches. Hey, can we have a Tuesday night healing meeting so we can invite that person along so they can come along and get prayed for so they can get healed? No. Just go and ask, hey, can I pray for you? Can I release the healing power of God into your broken leg? Just to see. It might work. It might not work. I just want to love on you. Just do it. Just do it. Like, let's keep it simple. But when it comes to the spiritual, there is a role where we, where we corporately together in what we do in prayer and intercession, we start to, to disrupt the spiritual governing authorities in the region. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. Now, my beloved ones, I say these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. That's you. You got the explosive power of Jesus living in you. Amen? All right. 
Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you'll be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. So you got to be disrupting his stuff. Yeah? We, we had a prayer. Are you okay if I share what I saw this morning? So we our, our pre-gathering prayer time and, and we're praying. And, and Bethy had just got this picture. It was like there was like a sword um, pointed at her forehead. And, uh, and it's like, there's like, you know, accusation and, and different things of what it kind of represented. And so we prayed and, and we're praying into it. And I had already knew that I was going to share this verse. I was like, the helmet of salvation. And I just saw, you know what you need to do? You need to headbutt that sword. Because there's such an intimidation. It's like, and so if I move forward, this sword is going to pierce my forehead. So that's not good. So what? I, and it keeps you immobilized. It's like, oh, but hold on a second. I'm in the power position. All authority has been given to Jesus, and I'm under his delegated authority. Let me grab that sword and, psh, you know, you know, seeing those movies, and it's like, you, maybe you don't watch those movies. I do. You know, where like someone points a gun at someone's head, and they grab it, and they're like, yeah, go on, do it. I dare you. All of a sudden, intimidation gone. She's like, I'm not afraid of you shooting me in the head. It's going to bounce off my helmet of salvation, dummy. Your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. And so it says, this is why you need to wear the armor. Not to protect yourself from them, but to protect you as you go into battle against them. There's no hiding. I've got the armor on. I'm safe over here. The armor, armor keeps you safe while well, you make it very, very dangerous for the enemy. If this region isn't spiritually changed because of our existence here, we're not doing a very good job. We're failing in our, as, at our, in our role as the church, as this governing spiritual body in this region. That's why we want to be in, in such a place that the church has such an influence because it's dealing with the spiritual realm and because it's serving in the natural realm that the world starts to go, we're so thankful that you're here. The local government goes, we are so thankful that you guys are here. It's because of you guys being here that this area is, is being blessed and is thriving. What you want to be is like, what would happen if this church got sucked out? Or what would happen if you got removed from your workplace? Would anything be different? It'd be totally different because I set the culture and I'm the one that's setting that example. And it might be that you shift the culture and it looks like the kingdom and that's good. But you know what I mean? Like it's got to be something where I'm like, I'm here to infect this place with the goodness of God, with the glory of God. Like, that's what I carry. I'm a conduit for the very presence of God everywhere that I go. And you might find, oh, but it's different in my work. But I'm not, what I'm not talking to you about is like, say, okay, I'm going to go ask the boss if I can start a Tuesday afternoon Bible study. Don't do that sort of stuff, please. Don't do that sort of stuff. Unless God, unless you've got like non-Christian workers coming to you because of the favor and the relationship that you built, say, man, I just want to learn the Bible. Can you teach me more about Jesus from the scriptures? And you're like, yeah, maybe we could get together at Tuesday at lunch. Yeah, we'd love that. Awesome. Then do that. Yeah? What I'm not saying is like, it's not going to change the world. More Bible studies aren't going to change the world. Doing what Jesus told you to do, obeying his commands, that's what's going to transform the world. We, we, we are educated beyond our obedience. We do far too much reading and not enough doing. Fired up. The leadership of the church are the equippers of the transformers and not just the transformers themselves. People will be healed, delivered, and changed by their engagement with Christ's body. But it's not the role of the leadership of the church to be the movement. They must equip the movement, empower the movement, and release the movement into the world. What we are doing in here must be impacting the world out there. Otherwise, it's not real. The church must never become an alternate reality for us. We don't want to live in this virtual reality of like kind of church over here, but then it really doesn't impact anything of the majority of the time that I spend outside of a corporate gathering of the church. 
because this is like this, like this made up little world over here. And that's my concern when we do like ministry stuff and we do all of these Christian activities because we just want to create a place where we feel safe, where we just get to be in the power position to set the culture. So it's why we don't like push for having a youth ministry or this ministry or that ministry because like we don't just want to create a place that where we get to be in the power position. What I would love is for the young people in our community to be out there infiltrating and influencing and impacting the world that they live in because they carry the reality of Jesus with them. And the same with you. Like if you're like, I could join a Christian sports team or join a non-Christian sports team, please join the non-Christian one. Whatever that even means. I know how you get Christian sport anyway. It's like, whatever, whatever that, that's just silly, silliness. But you know what I mean? Like, we got Christian music, and oh, this is so weird. So we need to stop training community leaders to lead Bible studies or prayer meetings and train them to understand kingdom ways and live out kingdom DNA values and how they might take them into the world and release them into society. Let your creative juices flow. If you're surrounded by people that don't know Jesus every day, ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. How can I impact these people? For you, Jesus. How can I love them? Don't think about what Christian event could I invite them to? Well, I can't invite them along on a Sunday because people pray in tongues and the worship goes on for so long and the preaching's all like intense and oh, oh, this isn't the right church for me. Don't invite them here. Invite them to your house for a barbecue. Invite yourself over for dinner. Like go, just hang out with them. Just be normal people because we're not gonna facilitate your social networks. It's not our job. We want to to bless you and equip you and empower you, but go out and be there in that place. You know what I love? You know, Christian schools are one of those ones where because we live in a, um, there's a danger of, again, how society does. It's like, well, here's the values, the dominant values of society, which is, um, you know, secular, Secular humanism, you could call it. And we say, oh, you want to be Christian? Okay, you, you just go over here in the corner. and You can have your nice Christian school and you can do that as long as that doesn't impact what we're doing here, okay? But, so, but there is that danger then is that we enclave everything and we go, I've got all this freedom but no influence. Now, again, Christian schools are one of those ones where they're oftentimes filled with families and kids who don't know Jesus. And so I'm not saying like, don't do it. But what I'm saying is, but there's then this whole realm that's not, we've got to see that it's the entire schooling system that we want to see impacted. Not just say, oh, well, we'll just focus on the the Christian schools, like every school. So if you're a a teacher in a Christian school, praise God that you have freedom to go hardcore free about Jesus. Yeah. And smother the kids in the love of God. Okay. But if you're a Christian, a, a, a teacher in a secular school, Do the same thing, just in a different way. Be the leaven of the kingdom there. You might be in a, it's like a Christian business versus a non-Christian one. You just got to be more creative. And God has creative ways to do it. Jesus was loved by people who didn't know Jesus. (laughs) Selah. You're a powerful person. You carry the creator of the universe in you. When you wake up every day, you have a destiny and a calling from God that's to be fulfilled. Wherever you are and whoever you are, God wants to use you. And again, when we talk about the heart journey stuff, it's a journey, not a destination. So I go, well, I'm not fixed enough. Just do what you can with what you have. But, but I don't have time because I'm doing this. It's like, just do what you can with what you have. If it's loaves and fishes, guess what? He's really good at multiplying things. But that's, again, see, that's when Jesus is challenging the disciples, when they're like, but we don't, we don't, we don't how can we feed this? He's like, were you not there when you, have, when you had five loaves and two fish and I multiplied it to feed 5,000 people? Did, that was yesterday, guys. And now you're grumbling about how we're going to provide. And the interesting thing is, what do they collect up? 12 baskets for 12 disciples. (laughs) So it's like, you know, you're carrying the basket of multiplication. You get to carry the basket of multiplication. It's not Jesus multiplying. He's going to do it through you. 
But you can look at yourself and say, I'm this small. And God says, guess what? Faith like a mustard seed moves mountains. Yeah, the two coins from that woman is a greater offering than the rich person. Everything he does is he takes the small and he says, but wait and to see how big I can make it. Even if you feel like you have nothing to give, give whatever you have and God will add his abundance to it. And the question is, who has God placed in your life that you can impact with the culture and reality of his kingdom? Because we can't transform nations if we don't love, learn to love our neighbors. We can get caught, I just want to go to the nations, then just love your neighbor. You know, I get all funny sometimes, like people go and they go on cross-cultural mission trips and they They'll sell all their stuff and spend all this money doing that and serve every day and they come back home and I'm like, where is that passion? Where's that lay down everything for, for my local neighborhood? Because like, do you, do you love Jesus or do you love the idea of being in this kind of, you know, radical environment that someone else has created for you? But go, Jesus, make me like that every day. Give me that boldness to, to preach on the streets if you lead me to do it. You know, give me the boldness to pray for that sick person, pray for my next door neighbor. Give me that boldness here, Lord, not just when I'm over there or not just when I'm with, you know, my, my church community. Let it be something that so captivates me in the same way that Jesus, he's like, I'm going to this place to spend time with the Father and his heart was moved with compassion for the broken and the lost. Let your heart be moved with compassion. And passion for what God has. But you need to know, like, we're not trying to build this place up to be something. This place is here to serve you, to serve the body of Christ. We believe we have a calling for, for reformation of the bride in this city. So there's things that God will, will call us to do that he might not call the church down the road to do. But it's not going to be through the ways that we've done it before. But just by being the leaven of the kingdom and releasing that into every area of your life. Letting God first infiltrate you and then releasing that out. Let me pray. Why don't you stand with me? Father God, I just thank you for this room filled with kingdom ambassadors, Lord, that are filled with your spirit, Lord. Filled with your spirit, the very spirit of the creator of the universe, the very spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that dwells in each one of us, Father. So we thank you, Lord, for a room filled with temples, God, but you are not a God that is contained to the temple, Lord. You want to be released. I just thank you, Father, that the curtain has been torn. Ha <laughs> ha. The curtain has been torn, Father, that we are not just holders of living water, Father, we are fountains of living water. But Father God, I just pray that you would inspire us this week, Lord. Fire us up, Lord, and let us taste even in a greater measure than we ever have before the very power of your presence on us, Father. I pray for, for fresh baptism, Lord, fresh Holy Spirit baptism, fresh immersion in your presence, Lord, that would fill you, that would be prompted by you, and that would do radical steps that would cross over the line of our fear, Lord, because we thank you, Lord, uh, for your power, love, and a sound mind that fear is not our friend, God. Fear is not our friend, Lord. But we are a people that have power, love, and a sound mind, God. So, Father, we just pray for a radical infusion of passion and power this week, God. And we thank you, Lord, that as we take, whether we have, uh, you know, a bakery or a basket full, Lord, that we know I've got something to give away. I can bless, I can love, I can serve, and I can see your kingdom come this week, Lord. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Jesus, that you desire to use us. You want to use us, God. You want to use us to see your kingdom come. You don't have a plan B. We are your plan A, God. And we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, use us, God. Let it, we want to partner with you. We want to do what you're doing. We want to see what you're seeing and say what you're saying, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.